So uh, we continue where we left yesterday uh, and I promised to talk about what I see as a third major transformation in the history of Europe that I, through the empire of course, he reached other parts of the world and was interconnected with that. And that is the, what we now think of as the birth of a consumer society in which objects uh, take on an enormous role for people, for their sense of identity in themselves. So uh, realizing that has really uh, made us reframe cultural history. It used to be thought that we need to understand people through their interrelation with each other with institutions, the state, the church, the family, or guilds. But now, we really think that from around 1450 onwards, we have to understand people and identities also through people's relationship with objects. And a very good illustration of just how forceful that realization that the world is suddenly full of things is, uh, you can see in this remarkable drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, the great Italian Renaissance artist. What he's describing here is literally the sky being full of objects that fall down. You can, you can see them identify everyday things uh, but also more precious things. So this is in the Renaissance and then in the 18th century a uh, typical depiction of a European uh, is this, a collector in his study and he's also surrounded by so many things. He is amassed which he cannot quite control anymore but is clearly in relationship with and expresses his identity through, through them. Okay, it's a good topic. Continuing with the exposition of the day of yesterday, the eh, professor mentioned that it was going to talk about the revolution in which it was the birth of the consumer society. And it's a moment in which the objects play an enormous, an important role for the person. Eh, se propone una forma de reconceptuar, de remarcar la historia cultural eh, para así este, ver la, la, la relación de las personas entre ellas, la relación de las personas con el Estado, la relación de las personas con la familia y con la Iglesia. Es a partir eh, de los años 1450 en adelante. Eh, también para eh, analizar la, a las personas y la relación, por ejemplo, con sus identidades y con los objetos en un mundo lleno de cosas. Eh, la pintura que se tiene es este, un cuadro, bueno, es la obra de Leonardo da Vinci y se muestra el cielo lleno de objetos, de objetos cotidianos, de objetos preciosos. Eh, it was, it was only one slide, right? Sí, he's eh, almost overwhelmed by the things he's collected, but clearly that is his major occupation. Uh, este, la figura, de, bueno, la imagen de acá representa a un coleccionista del eh, siglo XVIII, es un coleccionista inglés, y está rodeado de muchísimas cosas, este, adquisiciones, ¿no? Y es eh, la imagen de un, una, de un típico europeo, ¿no? Eh, rodeado de nuevo de muchas cosas. So there are different approaches to object cultures um, that I would particularly like to highlight. One of them, and the most familiar one, is that the function of these objects is to feature as tools of social distinction. So what Pierre Bourdieu, of course, called the social capital. And he very much thought that the way in which people um, uh, amass or collect or acquire objects is a function of a particular social group they want to be identified with. And in his great work, Distinctions, he said that, you know, you can tell this by class. So laborers will consume particular groups of objects, middle classes, the bourgeoisie will consume very different types of objects and develop different tastes. And the whole point of this is simply to distinguish themselves from other uh, 
uh, other groups lower down in the social hierarchies. But uh, against this, uh, this very collectivized vision, um, we had the important theory of practice as tactics by uh, De Sartor. And what he argued is that you can't just treat people as if they all behave in absolutely the identical way. People from uh, different classes use particular strategies for their own goals. And they can be also against the taste of, of the others, the norm. Uh, a contribution from anthropology, which I would like to highlight, is that of Alfred Gell. What he asks is that what we really want to understand is the role of objects in wider symbolic worlds. So, of course, they often signal prestige, distinction, but objects also have other, for instance, emotional functions. They remind us of other people, they help to channel fears or hopes. They are connected to a whole symbolic world, for instance, the animal world, and we have to be attentive to that. So we need to ask, how do objects become vehicles of prestige and personality in a wider world way? And we need to ask with Arjun Apadurai, at the same time, the question of who decides the value of particular objects, what is the politics of value then? And also, what do you have to know in order to use particular ob objects? So luxury objects, for instance, they often are luxury objects first because they're rare and difficult to get, but also because they're linked to particular repertoires of how they are to be consumed, and you've got to know how you're meant to consume them. So a politics of knowledge. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sorry, it's all the approaches. Okay. Um, 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 bueno, hay distintos enfoques para estudiar a los objetos culturales o desde la perspectiva cultural. Um, los objetos tienen ciertas funciones. Este, por ejemplo, estos siempre han servido para la distinción eh, social eh, o lo que sería también denominado como el capital social. Eh, la forma en que las personas este, eh, coleccionan ciertos objetos eh, eh, o reúnen ciertos, eh, bueno, ciertas adquisiciones depende del grupo social que pertenecen. Por ejemplo, si hablamos de clases, tenemos a los obreros que tienen una cierta forma de pensar, ¿verdad? Este, y, y, de, y tenemos también a los de la clase media y que, eh, eh, bueno, ellos como pertenecen a distintos estratos Este, tienen eh, formas de adquirir cosas este, y las cosas en sí eh, bastante distintas. Entonces, a partir de esos objetos se puede también este, visualizar la jerarquía social. Hay una visión este, eh, colectiva y hay un autor que decía que no se puede pensar que todas las personas en la misma clase actúan eh, del mismo modo, eh, porque cada uno lo hace con, distintos, con distintas metas. Eh, hay que analizar lo que es este, el papel de los objetos en el mundo simbólico. Los objetos, si bien pueden tener una función de prestigio, una función de poder, también eh, involucran a los sentimientos y, de nuevo, se relacionan con el mundo simbólico. Así que es algo a lo que tenemos que prestar bastante atención. Eh, al poder, al prestigio, a la personalidad a partir de los objetos. Eh, una de las interrogantes que eh, mencionó fue este, ¿Quién decide el valor de los objetos eh, en particular? En el caso, por ejemplo, de los objetos de lujo, ¿no? este, suntuosos. Puede ser el poder, la autoridad, pero eh, también este, se relacionan con el cómo tienen que ser consumidos. What was the last line for the so the, uh, the luxury objects in particular was also tied to a knowledge of how they are to be consumed. Sí, entonces, por ejemplo, los objetos suntuosos están eh, relacionados con el modo en que tienen que ser consumidos, eh, una política de conocimiento, ¿no? Sobre estos objetos. Particularly relevant for this period is in contrast to Bourdieu, who seems to think 
that all uh, social classes have very clearly defined places in the hierarchy of a society. Uh, to to uh, say that actually the societies we're studying are often very different. So hierarchies are often much more flexible, they're poorly defined, and that's precisely why they're subject to rivalry. And that is where the objects uh, make a real difference. For instance, the rivalry between the merchant classes and the aristocracy is often articulated over uh, the, the object. So we can say there, in a sociological perspective, they're really crucial for micro-level ordering um, uh, in uh, redefining the status positions, uh, in particular between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. So we can see this, for instance, in portraiture of uh, the Renaissance. Uh, this is an example I've studied at great length. It's a man who is an accountant of a merchant firm. So um, um, a really a, a very good example of the bourgeoisie. And uh, you can decode everything he wears and the very fact that he has a portrait painted of him, of course, in terms of these um, uh, ambitions. And in fact, he succeeds. He will be made by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, a member of the aristocracy. So it's a refined instrument to play the lute. He's wearing a very fine linen shirt. Um, he wears fur. He wears a very expensive black dye, and so on and so forth. And in fact, um, the, the memory of him is such that he's in the, one of the most important collections of portraits in the world, in the Louvre and Paris. Ok, uh, entonces eh, hay un enfoque final relevante para estudiar ese periodo en eh, todas las clases sociales. Eh, han definido sus lugares eh, de acuerdo a una jerarquía eh, en la sociedad. Eh, se habló de una jerarquía o de la flexibilidad de esta, eh, se mencionó un poco a la aristocracia, y desde una perspectiva sociológica hay algo así como micro niveles. Eh, se mencionó también a lo que era la burguesía y la aristocracia y en la figura se puede ver este, a un hombre este, que es contador, es un burgués y en el retrato se ve, eh, bueno, es el retrato de ese contador eh, que, está, eh, que denota ambición, este, denota ser este, un, o bueno, su... Eh, su, su meta de ser un miembro de la aristocracia está, porta una camisa de eh, seda, me parece, eh, pieles y eh, viste de blanco. Entonces, y además de otros elementos bastante costosos. Eh, what was the last line you said? I'm sorry. Um, what was the most? So, uh, what was the last line? I don't know, but you know, what, what I want to say is that dress obviously becomes particularly important. Um, In this period, then. Claro, entonces eh, eh, lo que se debe resaltar acá es que la vestimenta se convierte en un elemento bastante importante en este periodo de tiempo. And this then um, has a, a very curious effect. Um, Francisco Bertengrot showed you yesterday the title page of Ortelius with the different continents. So this is a different title page that's interesting in that context, and it is from a book that wants to represent the costumes of the different parts of the world. And you can see that the other continents are, um, um, are represented as being rooted in their traditions. And Europe is the man here. You can see uh, Europe, Asia, America, Africa. Um, uh, and the European man is naked. Why is he naked? And what's he wearing under his, um, under his um, arm? So he's wearing a piece of cloth because he's lost all his traditions. And all he wants is the newest fashion. And he's on his way to the tailor to ask the tailor, what should I be wearing? So it's a, it's a form of, of cultural adopted nudity. Uh, whereas, um, whereas America is represented as uh, clad with feathers and otherwise nude. Uh, uh, out of a tradition, uh, the European 
seems to have lost all of them. Este, bueno, y acá en esa imagen se ve un efecto bastante curioso, ¿no? Se representan eh, los, las indumentarias de distintas partes del mundo y se visualizan también las tradiciones enraizadas. Eh, por ejemplo, al, en la, bueno, el primer hombre que es el hombre desnudo eh, es el, el europeo, ¿no? Se lo, se lo ve sin ropa. Eh, no obstante, debajo del brazo tiene algo, que es una pieza, es un, un pedazo, un rollo de tela, ¿no? Y es porque ha perdido toda su tradición. Entonces va con este pedazo de tela al sastre y le dice, ¿qué me puedes hacer con esto? ¿No? Es una desnudez adoptada culturalmente. Y, uh, y por otro lado, América se la pinta eh, de forma desnuda, con plumas, etc. But what's interesting um, then finally about this representation is of course a European man who's stepping forward. So there's a very ambivalent notion of civilizational progress here. Eh, lo que es interesante es de que el hombre europeo está como que va hacia adelante, se, eh, o sea, se, se dirige hacia adelante. Entonces está ahí implicada la noción eh, de progreso. So what I want to focus on for the rest of the brief talk is in fact the American tradition of feather work that's interested me more recently. And to talk to you about some of the more recent approaches I and others have developed in looking at them. Let's focus in on a specific object and uh, this very beautiful 17th century uh, Latin American feather fan. This is an extra, just a, a, a close up of it. It's a fan that is in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Eh, bueno, entonces, eh, lo que nos vamos a enfocar en esta pequeña eh, charla va a ser en, en un trabajo en particular hecho, eh, un trabajo, una obra hecha con plumas eh, americana. Y lo que se ve ahora es un objeto en particular que data del siglo XVII, hecho de nuevo con plumas. Es un, es un traje cerrado. Continue. And what I want to um, uh, try it as an approach here is to ask, well, what about if we handle an object, what questions can we develop then simply from the object as well? And you might look at this and want to know, well, how do you make an object of this kind? What's involved, a skill, in making an object of that kind? And then, if it's a very skill for, uh, a skilled process, that tells you something about the investment and the meaning it had for a particular group of users, clearly, at the time. Now, uh, the art of feather artistry um, still exists in some places today, in particular in Paris. And just this slide uh, uh, that is of a contemporary feather artist shows you something of what was involved. Of course, in the Peruvian tradition, for instance, you had, uh, again, very fine motor skills that were about knotting uh, uh, the feathers to a foundation fabric. Here, similarly, very fine motor skills at work. So it's a highly skilled process, uh, and it's a lot of aesthetic decisions about what colors to combine and how to assemble them. Ok. Um, bueno, entonces, eh, es, hay, okay. eh, hay varias pre preguntas que se desprenden de un objeto, ¿no? Eh, por ejemplo, el manejo que hay que darle eh, Y hay que también preguntarse qué involucra, eh, qué, qué involucra, por ejemplo, las habilidades ¿no? para inventar cierto objeto. Eh, en el objeto mostrado, por ejemplo, eh, se puede inferenciar de que es, ha requerido de bastante habilidad y si ha requerido de bastante destreza es porque ha habido un, una mayor inversión de tiempo, etc. Eh, lo que se refiere a trabajos artísticos de plumas eh, se pueden ver, por ejemplo, en París. Y los artistas que trabajan con plumas también se pueden encontrar en las tradiciones eh, peruanas. Es un proceso que involucra bastante habilidad 
y que involucra también este, tomas de decisiones estéticas, ¿no? Por ejemplo, qué colores combinar. And uh, what is fascinating then is so this is the opposite example from Peru, and this is uh, one of the first representations of a feather worker in Europe. That it seems to be the notion of delicacy and subtlety which is bound up with Latin American feather work and which Europeans admire that really then roots the art of feather making in Europe itself from the 16th century onwards. Suddenly we begin to have guilds of feather workers and that is clearly a very rare example of where we can say a Latin American aesthetic influences a whole notion in Europe of what it means to be ingenious and artful. Eh, y el ejemplo aquí es fascinante. Este, eh, bueno, está relacionado este, con algo de Perú. Eh, se trata de un trabajador que eh, trabaja con plumas ¿no? y que es influenciado en Europa. Eh, se puede ver acá eh, la delicadez, eh, la sutileza eh, enraizada en el arte. Eh, luego vinieron trabajadores con plumas y en realidad lo que se puede ver en, este, en esta obra es como el, la ingeniosidad eh, de las obras latinoamericanas han influenciado a la europea, que es un caso no siempre visto. So uh, that was more uh, the, the more current uh, methodological approaches that are interesting are asked, for instance, by a historian of science such as Pamela Smith. Uh, what she asks is, well, let's think about the craftspeople who are involved in making objects of that kind, and let's ask about their knowledge and skills and how these were then valued in societies. Uh, but also, and this is uh, very much forefronted by anthropologists such as Tim Ingold, well, let's think about what would it may, may it meant to work with uh, a material such as feathers or leather or fabric, and what was the power of these material? How can we talk about the material itself as an agent? And in the case of feathers, that becomes rather obvious that it's bound up with notions of the subtlety, of the delicacy, in itself. Uh, bueno. Eh, eh, luego viene otra autora, este, Smith, eh, que se comienza a preguntar sobre el trabajo de, los, de las personas que trabajan con, bueno, este, los artesanos, ¿no? Eh, que trabajan con estas manualidades. Y, y, y se surgen varias preguntas, ¿no? Por ejemplo, se pregunta sobre el conocimiento que ellos tienen los artesanos y sobre las habilidades que también poseen. Y se pregunta eh, qué, qué involucraría eh, para que ellos o cómo se sentirían trabajando con este tipo de material, ya que las eh, es implícito eh, saber es implícito ver de que trabajar con las plumas este, eh, involucra sutilidad y delicadeza. So uh, my argument is that in order to really understand the power of objects in these societies, we need these new tools. So the first one is obviously we need the craft of the historian to read all the textual evidence. But in addition, we also need to handle the objects themselves, understand how they were made. And in addition, we need uh, to use digital microscopes to look at them really closely, understand techniques, and finally we can engage in reconstructing them so that we get, uh, likewise, a better skill, sense of skills involved. So historians need to operate on new levels if they want to be material historians. And I'll show you one example from the British Museum in London and why it is important to handle objects. This is a small triptych, and when we looked at it in the catalog, it said it had hummingbird feathers, uh, but the photo in the catalog did not show one. And it was only when we used the digital microscope that we saw that uh, behind this, obviously, scene of the crucifixion uh, was underlaid this very Latin American uh, aesthetic of the iridescent hummingbird feathers and that was really very magic when you looked at it 
and clearly facilitated a different engagement of piety for those who used this very small silver object. Um, <coughs> Um, ok, entonces eh, el argumento de la profesora viene acá, es para realmente entender eh, este tipo de trabajo. Se requieren ciertos elementos, ¿no? Primero, este, se requiere del historiador eh, cierta habilidad, cierta destreza. Segundo, hay que saber manejar al objeto. Eh, tercero, este, se emplea el microscopio para descubrir las técnicas que fueron empleadas eh, en la realización de este objeto. Y cuarto es el proceso de reconstrucción. Entonces, eh, se requiere que el historiador explore todos estos niveles, si es que desea convertirse en un historiador material. Eh, en la pieza se muestra un, eh, small, un pequeño este, tríptico eh, que ha sido elaborado con plumas de picaflores. Eh, se, luego que se analizó con el microscopio digital, I'm sorry, what did you find when you used that digital microscope? So it, it used the hummingbird feathers, and it was really about the luminosity of the feathers that facilitated their engagement with the supernatural. Eh, cuando se analizó con el microscopio digital, eh, se vieron que habían este, plumas bastante brillantes, bastante luminosas, y Sí, y era como se conectaba the, the feathers. So to see the power of the object, it, it makes you see the, how exactly it's made. It makes you understand the effect of it and why people cared about it so much. Sí, y este y ver el efecto que tenían estas plumas, este, uno se da cuenta, uno percibe el efecto que tenían las personas, no el poder de las mismas. And another example for using the digital microscope, and I did that with my postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Stefan Hans, at the University of Cambridge, is to look closely at the feather fan I showed you at the beginning. This is, uh, brings home just how incredibly difficult it would have been to create one, each one of these flowers. Y en otro trabajo, este, cuando también se empleó el microscopio digital en compañía de un compañero de la profesora en, en la Universidad de Cambridge, se puede ver cuán difícil este, era incorporar, eh, you said feathers or flowers? Feathers. Eh, incorporar cada una de estas plumas. Y el trabajo increíble que es. And now I want to end by giving you an example of what you can achieve with reconstruction. Uh, feathers are used very much for the military as well, uh, first in tournaments in the Middle Ages and then afterwards. And uh, a, a clear simple function of these feathers, as you can see, is to increase the height of a person mm -hmm. and therefore to conjure up the emotion of all of that person. So here we almost have a doubling in height of that person through the use of ostrich feathers. Uh, ok, entonces para finalizar este, voy a hablar un poco sobre la reconstrucción y en realidad las plumas han sido bastante usadas para fines eh, militares, ¿no? eh, por ejemplo en los torneos, en la Edad Media. Eran usadas para incrementar, este, para aumentar la altura de una persona y para así este, avivar la emoción de la misma. En este dibujo se puede ver a un guerrero este, con las plumas de una avestruz. And uh, moreover, through reconstructing, one can get a sense just of how expensive it would have been to bring these feathers from Africa, choose them very carefully, and uh, layer them up on top of each other. And once more, how much skill there was involved. When we uh, reconstructed uh, making um, uh, panache of feathers, the result was not immediately impressive. Uh, because what happens if you take an ostrich feather and then you want to dye it, it behaves of course very much like hair, so it becomes wet and you have to literally bring it back to life. This is what it looks like. So the whole uh, repertoire of skills in recreating these beautifully dyed very complex feathers um, is something we have to learn again. 
Eh, bueno, y esto es lo que eh, eh, implica el proceso de reconstrucción, ¿no? Este, por un lado es bastante costoso eh, traer estas eh, plumas de África o de otro lugar y luego escogerlas, ¿no? este, discriminarlas. Y también este, se involucra un trabajo, la habilidad humana. El proceso, cuando eh, la profesora eh, y sus colaboradores intentaron reconstruirlo, no resultó para nada impresionante al modelo inicial. Eh, porque se toman las plumas de la avestruz y luego se tiñen, pero cuando se tiñen se mojan, entonces eh, hay que hacer otros procesos. Eh, y no podrían recrear. What was your last one? Sorry. So the, this is a whole repertoire of skills which we've lost sight of. Okay. Y sí, se puede ver este, cómo se trata de replicar eh, las habilidades eh, to dye them, yeah. para te teñirlas. So, and to conclude then, uh, what, what the fascination with Latin American featherwork led to was the spread of this new as accessory in Europe. And it's like a language we still have to decode with all its varieties. Um, you know, you can see here obviously in the Dutch 17th century, inspired very much by the parrot. Uh, we can see here a style which matches a feather with, um, uh, with jewelry. And this is the last slide. We can once more see the enduring effect of this aesthetic of feather objects on military culture up to the 20th century and sometimes even still today. It was very common uh, to wear this as new form of male adornment that is clear emotional effects of inspiring all in um, other people. Uh, y este, para concluir, entonces, eh, se ve la fascinación con algunos elementos de la, Latinoamérica, ¿no? Por ejemplo, este accesorio que fue empleado luego en Europa, eh, los, las plumas de los este, loros, eh, las plumas este, también este, involucradas con la joyería, ¿sí? y estos objetos a partir de las plumas han sido usados hasta el día de hoy, desde antes hasta el día de hoy, y se, bueno, se manifiesta ahora como una nueva forma de entender la dominancia masculina. And I'm going to focus on the case of Brazil. What is interesting is that the, the Portuguese colonial experience concerning uh, relationship with different ethnicities is very much defined by two main authors. Gilberto Freire from Brazil, who in the 1930s published a, a crucial book uh, um, masters and slaves, and uh, he, he developed uh, all his theory about the Brazil and then the Portuguese speaking world in the 50s and 60s, and he enlarged it and uh, created this musotropical theory, uh, stating that the Portuguese uh, had a way to mix with other people and uh, Portuguese colonization was based on mild uh, racism. So this is Gilberto Frey's uh, theory. And he uh, was uh, also thinking about the case of Brazil as being quite uh, mild with racism and uh, with his mixing. On the other hand, we have the other author, Charles Boxer, who in the uh, early 60s, uh, and after producing several books, uh, and uh, uh, on the boxer was one of the most productive persons, he produced on the Portuguese uh, uh, Civil Empire, he produced on the Dutch uh, uh, expansion, uh, mainly on Brazil, but also on Africa, Asia, and he, um, Boxer, published a, a book in '63 on uh, uh, race relations of the Portuguese Empire in which he showed systematic racism. 
meaning segregation of native people, uh, discrimination of people uh, throughout the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Um. Bueno, este, el día de hoy no voy a, el profesor no va a mostrar imágenes, eh, pero va a hablar sobre el racismo de los portugueses en Brasil. Eh, para comenzar, este, va, bueno, sí, va a analizar las relaciones entre las distintas etnicidad, etnias, ¿no? etnicidades, y va a tomar este, como claves a dos autores, a Gilberto Freire y a Charles Oxford. Eh, Gilberto Freire... Ok. Este, a Gilberto Freire tiene un libro particular que se llama Masters and Slaves. Eh, Masters? Master. Masters and Slaves. Este, amos y esclavos. Eh, eh, y cómo toma a Brasil en el mundo lusófono, ¿no? en el mundo donde el portugués se habla. Tiene una teoría llamada lusotropicalismo. ¿no? Lusotropicalismo. Y este, él propone que los portugueses este, sí fueron racistas, pero fueron medianamente racistas, de que no fue algo bastante eh, violento, no, no fue extremo. Eh, Esto es en el caso de Brasil. Este, luego, el segundo autor es Charles Boxa. Boxa. Eh, a inicios de los 60. Eh, fue, una, fue un autor bastante prolífico. Eh, y analiza este, bueno, los lugares de África, Asia, y publicó en el año 1963 eh, un libro y él propone de que hubo un racismo sistemático eh, y hubo discriminación. I don't know what was your last one. Um, so, my, my argument is that Uh, there was, uh, and also, well, we will, we will discuss a little bit uh, Gilbert Freire later because Gilbert Freire is crucial in all this, this story. And he comes back all the time. So it's, it's, it's there all the time. And, um, and also Gilbert Freire um, evolved in time. In the 30s, with the, with the book uh, um, Senores Escravos, Uh, he, um, uh, master, Masters and, and Slaves, he, when he published it in, in 1933, we will see how he, um, uh, we will see how he created a new national idea, a new national identity. And it's not easy to create a new national identity. He really had an impact because he, for the first time, praised mixed race people, I mean in Brazil. Uh, so he disrupted the, the, the previous vision of white supremacy. And that, that was important. Later, when he, in, the, in, the late, in the 40s and mainly the 50s, In, 50, in 1950, he accepted uh, an invitation by Salazar regime in Portugal, dictatorship, to visit the colonies. He accepted it, he visited the colonies, and he praised the Portuguese colonialism. So he had shifted from the 30s to the 50s. And then, when the military dictatorship came uh, to Brazil in 64, he also did not denounce the military dictatorship and accepted it. So it's the end of his shift from a more liberal uh, stance to a very, very conservative stance in the 50s and 60s. But um, his ideas were quite ideological. And Charles Boxer had a role to dismantle that uh, rose vision of the Portuguese mild racism and showing how colonialism uh, had meant segregation and discrimination all over the world. Uh, so my argument is that uh, we need to understand the context of this racism. Uh, the Portuguese racism was not different from uh, uh, the other European racism. It's the 
same segregation, the same discrimination, uh, based on justification of the uh, international division of labor, based on justification of slavery, uh, and the Portuguese were crucial in slave trade, we have to, th to, to think about it. Uh, if you look at the uh, slave trade database organized by David Eltis and, and others, they have 12 million and 600,000 slaves transported from the late 16th, 15th century to the 1860s from Africa to the Americas and the Portuguese transported more than 40 percent. So, um, the Portuguese was, were very involved in all, all, all this. So, my argument is that they uh, had uh, the same racism, and we will see uh, uh, discrimination and segregation. Um, but I will leave the second part of the argument after the translation. Okay. Um... Este, entonces su argumento principal se va, va a tomar al autor Gilberto Freire este, lo va a tomar principalmente él porque ha sido bastante importante este, es un autor que siempre va y viene y que ha evolucionado en el tiempo en especial con esta obra Señores y Esclavos eh, que es este, Los Amos, Los Señores y Los Esclavos eh, de 1933 lo importante de Freire es de que él creó una nueva idea nacional, una nueva identidad nacional y este, ello causó un impacto antes no visto. Él este, elogió este, a las personas eh, mestizas, ¿no? eh, luego este, eh, rompió, entonces rompió con la, la visión eh, previa de la supremacía blanca. ¿no? Este, pero también se puede ver el cambio que hay entre Gilberto Freire entre los años 1940, 1950 y el cambio entre 1930 a 1950. En 1964 en Brasil este, se dio el gobierno militar ¿no? y este, es interesante porque eh, Freire no denunció este, el gobierno militar, no lo criticó. Entonces él pasó en la evolución este, de ser una persona bastante liberal a, conserva, a pasar a ser una persona conservadora. Eh, no obstante, sus ideas son bastante importantes. Él declara que el, la colonialidad en, el, sí, en, el, en, en la época colonial en Brasil hubo bastante segregación, hubo bastante discriminación. Eh, resaltense esos dos, segregación y discriminación, al igual que en otras partes del mundo. Este, en ese régimen eh, fue la misma segregación por los portugueses y de hecho los portugueses fueron cruciales en la trata de esclavos de acuerdo a los registros eh, se dice de que los portugueses bueno, eh, hubieron más de tratas de 12, mil, 12 millones de esclavos y los portugueses fueron responsables del transporte del 40% de estos eh, su, el argumento del profesor eh, se va a basar en que los dos pilares de este, eh, del racismo en portu, en, de los portugueses fueron eh, bajo la segregación y la discriminación. Well, uh, the other side of, of my argument is that uh, the slaves were forced to convert systematically, uh, which meant that the slaves and the native population dominated by the Portuguese power in the colonies, they were forced to convert in most part of the places. Which meant that they had a status of vassals of the king, even when they were slaves. The fact that they, that they were forced to convert meant also that they uh, would join confraternities. And finally, uh, the fact that they were uh, Christian would allow them uh, to petition the king. And this is something that you would not consider possible uh, to a slave. So they could petition the king also. So my argument is that you have all the elements of the European racism in the Portuguese-speaking world, 
but the fact that all slaves were forced to, uh, and native people were forced to, to convert, created a margin of negotiation. So, they, through confraternities, that's why in, the, in Brazil, for instance, one of the reasons, not, not the only one, one of the reasons uh, in Brazil to have so many emancipated people, uh, so many emancipated slaves, this was studied by uh, Vidal Luna uh, and Herbert Klein, uh, is because they had confraternities who supported, even financially, the process for emancipation. Uh, well, uh, in Europe, and they could involve people, uh, they had one million contracts for the East India Company, the Dutch East India Company celebrated more than one million contracts because they had access to all these uh, uh, European, uh, uh, German, for instance, and Scandinavian uh, labor market. So the Portuguese uh, Empire was overstretched, which meant that also they depended on uh, mixed race people, they depended on native people, converted, and uh, they, uh, in the case of, of Brazil, Brazil is a, is a, is a country where, where you had a majority of slaves until the end of the 18th century. So the Portuguese also needed uh, a buffer of mixed race people uh, to protect the, the, the colonial elite against this vast majority of slaves. So all this explains why there was this, ma this margin of negotiation in the Portuguese Empire, having the same racism as the other empires, but there was a margin of negotiation and there was a, a, a high level of uh, percentage of um, emancipation, of slave emancipation. Este, bueno, y el último elemento eh, a acotar es este, el caso portugués. Eh, el, el, el contexto portugués había sido bastante agobiado debido a los recursos humanos. Eh, Portugal había recibido a crecientes y crecientes este, cantidades de migrantes ¿no? en un país tan pequeño. Entonces, eh, el, la situación de Portugal era bastante agobiada, bastante penosa. Es distinta, por ejemplo, el caso de los este, Dutch, Dutch, holandeses, holandeses, holandeses. Eh, porque ellos sí contaban con un eh, mercado laboral extraordinario, entonces habían firmado muchos contratos, este, por ejemplo, con los alemanes, los escandinavos. Por otro lado, este, por el contrario, los portugueses dependían, sí, este, eh, requerían de las personas eh, mestizas y de los eh, nativos convertidos. ¿no? Eh, en el caso de Brasil eh, se resalta el importante número de esclavos eh, y la gran, la, la gran mayoría que ellos representaban. ¿no? Por eso es que se dio pie a esta negociación. Y también eh, se menciona el importante nivel en el el, bueno, lo importante que fue la emancipación, la negociación, el rol, el, el rol de la negociación en la emancipación de los esclavos. Bueno, uh, um, so in the Portuguese Empire, to conclude that section, we, uh, we had uh, clear, uh, even if the, they depended uh, much on, uh, on mixed race people in different parts of the world, uh, the European uh, colonists also will always have the upper hand and uh, they always discriminated against native people and mixed race people. For instance, you hardly had any uh, uh, priests in Africa until the 20th century. You had at the beginning of the 16th century, at the beginning of the Portuguese presence, and then you, you have virtually no African priests until the, the 20th century. Then uh, uh, in, uh, in Brazil also you had you very few native, native American priests and in Asia you had more priests in Asia but they, they were excluded from, in general from religious orders. So you have set, certain areas in which people were uh, clearly discriminated against. Of course you had 
this medieval heritage of discrimination against Jewish and, 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 uh, and Muslims uh, transferred, as I, I mentioned yesterday, to the uh, converted people. Uh, now, uh, turning to Brazil, uh, you had this idea of the, supreme, the white supremacy in Brazil much more developed from the 1870s to the 1920s. This was developed uh, mainly by the schools of law and the schools of medicine. It was linked to public hygiene, uh, this idea that mixed race people would be uh, degenerating the, the nation of Brazil, would be bad for Brazil. Uh, the, it was linked also to theories of criminality in, in the school of law. Uh, and uh, you have several authors, uh, I'm not going to much into, into this, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, uh, Nina Rodrigues and uh, Ruquete Pinto and other people uh, who uh, intervened in this period with a clear idea of uh, white supremacy. We have to say that the abolition of slavery in Brazil was late. It was the latest in Latin America as you may know. It was in 1888. And uh, immediately after, you had a policy of uh, uh, encouraging immigration from Europe. So you had an explosion of immigration from, from Portugal, Italy mainly, to Brazil, and a little bit from Spain. And these policies of immigration were encouraged and financed by the Brazilian government. It was part of the idea of replacement of the, of the slaves, but also an idea of whitening the population. This between 1870s and 1920s. Oh, este, para concluir con esta sección, este, se puede ver que el imperio portugués dependía de las personas mestizas, ¿no? No obstante, este, siempre se discriminó a los nativos y a los mestizos. Eh, al inicio, este, desde los inicios, este, sin embargo, virtualmente no había ningún eh, sacerdote africano, eh, sino hasta el siglo XX. Así como tampoco había sacerdotes nativos este, hasta después. Eh, En el caso de Brasil, eh, there are, hay siete áreas en las que podemos ver así que las personas eran limitadas a, ciertos, a ciertas posiciones, ¿no? Y siete áreas en las que las personas fueron discriminadas, ¿no? Y ya posteriormente se puede ver de acuerdo a la herencia judía o a la herencia musulmana. Eh, se quisiera este, resaltar acá sobre la idea de la supremacía de la raza blanca, ¿no? que fue o que ocurrió entre el siglo XVIII y más o menos el bueno y hasta el año de 1920, ¿no? A partir de las escuelas de medicina y de eh, derecho eh, se les vinculó a ciertas ideas, por ejemplo a la idea de la higiene pública, entre otros. Eh, se decía, por ejemplo, que las personas mestizas eh, iban a degenerar a la población y se las asociaba con las altas tasas de criminalidad. Esto fue tocado por ciertos autores, por varios autores, por ejemplo, Mino Rodríguez. Eh, se tenía esta idea de la supremacía del blanco. Eh, eh, luego eh, vino a Brasil, como sabemos, este, la inmigración europea, eh, que fue promovida este, bueno, para los migrantes italianos y españoles, que fue promovida por el gobierno brasileño. Y con dos este, intenciones. Por un lado era eh, re, sustituir a los esclavos y por otro lado era eh, blanquear a la población. So, the, the, this period of the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century saw some signs of a different approach. Silvio Romero uh, had a, an idea of perfectibility of different races and also he accommodated mixed race people, he was not uh, as much in favor of this white supremacy as the other authors. Uh, concerning Native Americans, you had 
contrasting visions, for instance, in the south of Brazil, where you had the German uh, colonization, you had an author, uh, von Hering, uh, uh, who uh, advocated even the extermination of uh, native people uh, because they were resisting the extension of the train in south Brazil. And on the other hand, you had in the north, you had the marshal, Candido Rondo, who was from native origin, uh, who created the service of protection of the Indians in 1910. It's, well, it was only, uh, uh, it was a, 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 um, an exception, uh, this service of protection of the Indians, uh, created by this, this uh, extraordinary man in 19, 1910. Um, 1922 is the centenary of the independence of Brazil, and this centenary had a great event. The, the week of modern art, celebrated in São Paulo by fantastic uh, authors, writers, and artists, and from uh, uh, and they uh, tried. It was the first time that the Portuguese uh, uh, heritage was uh, confronted, was challenged, and they said, "We have to get rid of this uh, uh, heritage. We have to build a new country." And we cannot always talk about the colonial past, we have to cut with the colonial past. So this was a very interesting, because this uh, week of modern, modern uh, uh, art, the Semana de Arte Moderna, uh, was um, extremely imaginative and productive in all, in all levels. And uh, led to uh, introduce primitivism and expressionism in art and, and literature, and you, you know how in Europe Primitivism had, uh, had had a major impact from the late 19th century to the, uh, to the Surrealists of the 20s and then 30s in Europe. So this was part of that movement and they accepted it. They, 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 they introduced these new, new ideas which were extremely disruptive concerning all the ideology, previous ideology of Brazil. And in 1928, you had two major texts from this group, Macunaíma by Maria de Andrade. If you have never read Macunaíma, it's a fantastic novel, fantastic. He was an inventor of language, he played with language, he invented new words, uh, and all the, the, the content is, is extraordinary, it's about Brazil itself, uh, it's very, very, it's difficult to, 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 to resume here. And then you had, by Osvaldo de Andrade, uh, the Manifesto Antropofágico, and uh, he praised cannibalism as a revolutionary way to deal with invaders, which was an interesting idea about uh, uh, reversing all the col colonial ideas about, about cannibalism and undermining. As yesterday you saw the title page of Ortelius, how cannibalism defined America. So Osvaldo uh, uh, de Andrade, he turned it on its head, saying that cannibalism was a fantastic way to deal with the invaders. Uh, so, completely de demolishing this uh, colonial pretension and colonial superiority. So, um, and then you have all this influence of William Dubois and other authors which uh, uh, was assumed in the uh, 1920s. And then finally, you have this uh, um, study of Gilbert Freire in, uh, uh, in the United States with Franz Boas. He met this extraordinary man, Rüdiger Bilden. Uh, I was previously talking about this man, Rüdiger Bilden, who was a, a Jewish uh, author and who worked on Brazil and had a, an extraordinary influence on Gilbert Freire. Also, José, José de Vasconcelos in Mexico uh, in uh, 1929, he also praised, he published this book on the cosmic race and he praised mixed race people as uh, typically Latin American and as the future of humankind. So, this late 20s and 30s, when, when Gilbert Frey published his book in Brazil in 1933 on masters and slaves, he had all these backgrounds so he could project it, uh, it into Brazil, but it had a major, major, major uh, uh, impact on Brazil and the creation of a national identity. Este, eh, a finales este, del siglo XIX y del siglo XX aparece Silvio Romero.
con, este ide con esta idea de perfección, no, no de perfección, de perfectibilidad, este, perfectibilidad de los nativos americanos. Eh, al sur de Brasil aparece eh, un, que donde han habido colonias alemanas aparece un, un personaje con la idea de exterminar a los nativos este, localizados al sur de Brasil porque ellos se oponían a la construcción del tren. Eh, hubieron sucesos en 1910 y luego en 1922 se dio el centenario de la independencia de Brasil y fue bastante eh, novedoso, ¿no? Porque eh, se dio, aconteció la Semana de Arte Moderno eh, en Sao Paulo, donde se aglomeraron, a, bueno, se reunieron varios artistas, ¿no? Escritores, pintores, eh, y comenzaron a cuestionarse sobre la herencia portuguesa y propusieron eh, construir un nuevo país y dejar lo colonial en el pasado. Entonces fue una, la, una actividad bastante, extremadamente productiva, muy imaginativa este, y comenzaron a explorar eh, y fusionar el primitivismo y, 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 y comenzaron a insertar nuevas ideas ¿no? que rompieran con las pasadas. Eh, el profesor eh, menciona y recomienda este, un libro sin igual, Macuna Lima. Macune Ima. Este, es fantástico este, porque explora el lenguaje, es bastante enriquecedor. Eh, además, hay otra obra este, que es Manifiesto Antropofágico eh, de Osvaldo Andrade, donde propone el canibalismo para este, manejar, para lidiar, para pelear contra los invasores. Entonces, usa, le, le da otro significado a este canibalismo, ¿no? Este, y este, para lidiar con la intervención colonial, contra la superioridad colonial. Eh, por otro lado, más tarde, este, Gilberto Freire eh, y Franz Boas en Estados Unidos trabajan con un autor judío. Y luego, en 1929, José de Vasconcelos en México eh, redacta un libro que se llama La raza cósmica. Eh, y establece que el futuro de la humanidad sería la raza cósmica, ¿no? o sea, quizás la latinoamericana. Entonces, entonces son todas estas obras que llegaron a tener cierta, una importante influencia en Gilberto Freire para eh, finalmente escribir su obra que era Amos y Señores, o Señores, perdón, este es, Amos y Esclavos, o Señores y Esclavos, que tuvo una eh, larga repercusión en Brasil. Para concluir, uh, to, to, to conclude, I, I, um, the ideas of, of uh, Gilbert Freire uh, were uh, tested uh, in, the, in the 50s already. Uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who became a president later, he was one of the big uh, uh, critics of Gilbert Freire, Ottavio Liani, and other authors. They proved Martin, Marvin Harris, for instance, an American uh, anthropologist worked also in Mozambique. Uh, he uh, considered that uh, they, they did local studies, they engaged in local research in different parts of Brazil, and they showed how segregation and discrimination was enormous. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about black people. Uh, and then you had also the black movement in Brazil, uh, which became very important throughout the 20th century, contesting also this idea of racial harmony, contesting this idea of a, a country of mixed race people uh, and showing how uh, the, at the bottom of society uh, you had always black people and they were uh, stuck in this spiral of poverty. Uh, and then later you had, after the end of the, of the military dictatorship in the 80s, in the 1980s, you had with the new Brazilian democracy, you started to have this black movement was more accepted uh, and they were influential and you had the uh, new policies of Brazil of affirmative action and encouraging uh, the uh, social mobility through education and uh, corrections to this uh, uh, heritage of um, 
black people from slavery to the uh, bottom layers of society. So the, the policies of affirmative action in excess of education, which were uh, in 2013 um, accepted by the Supreme Court of Brazil after a long, long term of judicial fight, uh, they uh, were, were implemented, have been implemented exactly to correct this historical uh, heritage of, of inequality. And of course the, the future uh, is that um, we have much less nowadays racism is not institutional, Race, racism is not supported by the government, so anti-racism is the norm, but we know how in practice you still have uh, social hierarchies and you still have the people uh, uh, who historically were left behind and who are still uh, struggling and you will not have uh, a, fi a fix for all this in, uh, in, in, uh, in the next times uh, but still uh, the struggle against racism uh, will go on. Este, ya, para concluir, este, eh, las proposiciones de Gilbert Cafeire fueron sometidas a prueba en los años de 1950 y este, Cardoso se convirtió en presidente y a, que tenía bastantes críticas, que criticaba fuertemente a Gilberto Freire. El profesor luego mencionó a un este, antropólogo de Mozambique Luego se dieron ciertos, varios estudios en Brasil este, para ver cuál era el alcance de esta segregación y la discriminación y los resultados arrojaron de que era, eran enormes. Este, entonces se propuso una, algo así como una armonía social ¿no? y se, también se, eh, se evidenció de que en, en la base de la sociedad en el estrato inferior siempre se encontraban las personas negras eh, en una espiral eh, de pobreza. ¿no? En el año 1980 el movimiento negro se hizo mucho más influyente y este, se, se, se alentaba la movilidad social eh, de estas personas negras que habían pasado de la esclavitud a la pobreza. En el año 2013 pasó algo sin precedentes. El, la, la Corte Suprema aceptó una eh, ley, promulgó una ley para, corre, para corregir esta herencia histórica de desigualdad. El día de hoy el racismo ya no se, no se, no se apoya, no se, eh, no se apoya por el gobierno. De hecho, el antirracismo es la norma. No obstante, las personas siguen luchando, este, no va a haber una solución en el, en el futuro próximo quizás, pero se sigue batallando en contra del racismo. ¿No? Eh, historios materiales, eh, cultural. Eh, Beverly Lemar, eh, April. March, no, he talked about the project, about the how the Asia and Europe connect with the textile tradition in North America. He researched in the museums, the Toronto, with the textile, no, with the feather, no, and in your experience with the Renaissance material, with uh, expression the contact, for example, Turkey, no, 16th century is uh, connected with Europe, no? a care, a war, a culture. For example, we can see uh, some influence impact the Middle East tradition in tradition the Western Europe in textile. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very glad that you're mentioning Beverly Lemire uh, because she uh, coined recently a, a, a term that works very well in connection to what I talked about and that is the term of cultural crossings. So cultural crossings of an aesthetic from Latin America in this case to, uh, to Europe. And of course we're just beginning to get a measure of just how much cultural crossings there were and how much of course the trades were interconnected and aesthetics were much more cosmopolitan 
in many ways than historians have previously acknowledged. And it's true, in particular, to say that um, a historian like Fernand Brodel, who did so much to um, uh, make material culture relevant, um, had this argument that fashion really principally emerged and happened in the West. And that is certainly, as Beverly and I also very strongly argued, um, something we need to differentiate. So we can certainly see um, a, a very strong trade between um, uh, between what you call Turkey or the Ottoman world, um, uh, also to the, the Indian Ocean. And of course, this becomes all more interconnected in the 16th century. So Lima itself becomes, as, as you know, a center for Chinese textiles that are brought here. And, and so the exchange is certainly much wider than you previously thought. Turquía y el mundo del renacimiento, las tradiciones textiles. Este, sí, la profesora dice, hablaron de una autora. Y la profesora Beverly Lemire. Sí, este, y la profesora, eh, sí, este, agradeció la pregunta del profesor porque ella también este, comenta sobre lo que son los cruces culturales. Eh, la profesora había expuesto sobre eh, el aporte latinoamericano, ¿no? Eh, sobre estos intercambios culturales y se puede ver ahora que las técnicas que se habían empleado eran más y más cosmopolitas de lo que los historiadores alguna vez habían pensado y también se puede ver de que la moda este, surge uh, en el oriente eh, hay, una, hay un fuerte intercambio eh, por ejemplo en el caso de Turquía y el mundo otomano con Where? which country or which place traded with Turkey and the Ottoman world. So essentially, you know, then, uh, you know, we really get more exchange with the Indian Ocean countries, and then we have, you know, the, we're in the process of studying this, but it was certainly much more diffused than we previously thought. It's also stimulating Venetian inventions, particularly. Okay. Entonces, este, en el caso de Turquía y el mundo otomano, habían establecido intercambios con la India y con otras eh, naciones alrededor de los océanos. ¿no? Eh, en el caso de Lima, por ejemplo, este, Lima fue un punto clave para los, textiles, para los textiles chinos. Entonces, ha habido bastante difusión, eh, ha habido mucho intercambio eh, de lo que inicialmente se creía. Francisco, you are Portuguese, you live in Britain. Britain, this is a long tradition in colonialism, imperialism. Uh, Britain is in Africa, similar to Portugal in Africa, no? Britain uh, developed the colony in Caribbean, in North America, Portugal in South America. Uh, we can uh, think about the comparison between the Portuguese and British experience in, you know, in connecting the race, connecting the Africa and uh, America, the Portuguese to British experience in this uh, you know, topic. Is it the race? Is it the Brazil? For example, the Caribbean British and the Brazil Portuguese. Well, uh, that's a good question because um, the, the British, uh, at the beginning, they had the model of the Greek uh, colonization. They, w they went to, to North America and they created their colonies without much contact with the native populations. Uh, so it's like these Greek colonies going elsewhere establishing themselves, doing trade, and not mixing much with the local populations. Uh, when they went to, to, to India, it was a commercial model, and they created their trading posts, and uh, uh, they tried uh, for a while not to get involved in conquest, and in that respect, it was a different model from the Portuguese and even from the Dutch uh, experience because the Dutch started to conquer territory also after the 1620s. So, uh, the turning point uh, and in, in, the, in the United States, the, the, the British 
they kept developing their territories, they made constant treaties with the native populations which were constantly betrayed, and they conquered more and more territory. And the native people, with very, very few converts, uh, they were considered alien populations. And they were considered alien populations until the 18, around 1870. Then they were considered protected populations and they were only considered citizens in, in 1920. So the, the British model is a model of clear segregation. And when they uh, uh, conquered India, or, uh, um, they ruled partly uh, uh, with, um, with, uh, uh, with the involvement of local elites. It was so-called indirect rule, uh, and this was replicated also in Africa. So it was not a project of conversion at all. So it was bad for, for trade to engage in conversion of the, of the native people. And it was a model of political dominion uh, subordinated to the trade purposes. Uh, or later, taxation on territories. Um, the Portuguese case uh, is very much uh, is much more linked to the Roman uh, uh, colonial world. It's a colonization which was followed by mixing with, with local populations, with all the racist prejudices. The fact that the Portuguese were mixing didn't prevent any racism, so there was clear an, an hierarchy, a perception of superiority of the white people, uh, but there were margins of negotiation with the mixed race people coming up, uh, being uh, the, the, the white colonists depending, depending on, on these this mixed race people. But the project was, was also a religious project of conversion of, of uh, native population, of integration of this native population. So, in general, even if you have a lot of segregation in, in the Portuguese speaking world, you have much more discrimination than se segregation. So that's how, how I would compare both, both uh, cases uh, from a racist point of view. Oh. Well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and after my question to, to Professor Francisco, okay? Uh, first, I am curious about the Pamela Smith concept uh, of tacit knowledge. But in relation to your work, I am fascinated uh, because of your work, the work you have done in order, in order to experience, experience the uh, elaboration, the, the, uh, the making, how the making of uh, feathered objects. No? So, uh, I would like to ask you about this concept in relation to your work and, and if you, you are uh, trying to mix the, uh, the social sciences in your work, uh, if you are doing a kind of ethnography uh, because you are experiencing the work of making fe feathered objects. Yes. No? So, so, so we're trying to recreate this. Um, this is a new movement um, in uh, Harvard University. He has a, a making knowing project. Columbia University has this project around uh, Pamela Smith's group. Um, and in Cambridge, uh, likewise, uh, some of us are very interested in, in this approach. Um, and, and the reason is simple, so we have to retrain in part as historians because we used to think that um, uh, our sources are all texts and, and it turns out, well, very little of Kraft's knowledge was actually written down. And that is the notion of tacit knowledge. People knew how to do things. Like when you're a good cook, you know, you, you, know, you don't write down this and this and this. It's, what, you know, it's, it's implied and it's handed down from generation to generation. 
And um, in, in many cases, we have to therefore relearn them um, of what they would have known about. And, uh, and very often, uh, the argument is this is very significant knowledge. So it's not just the, the great ideas of philosophers and so on that, that matter as knowledge. It's that knowledge recreated the material world, and the material world had such significance for people's social and emotional lives. So uh, that is the argument. Yeah, so it's, as I say, it's, um, and ethnography is a good expression for it. Um, we have to think ourselves into these sensibilities of the time. I have seen that you also mentioned uh, Tim Ingle, that this yeah. is an anthropologist that talks about the anthropology as a philosophy. Yes, um, and, you know, and here the notion that, you know, because I mean, if you did the shortcoming um, of a theory like produce um, on, on distinctions that you know, it doesn't really seem to matter what the object is or what it's made from. Um, the argument is that we can only really understand uh, the power at least of some materials by understanding their properties and therefore how involving or engaging they were of the senses and of emotions in particular. And to Professor Francisco, uh, about the uh, primitive, the celebrations in the for the uh, center, the, center, the independence, no, in Brazil. You talk about primitivism, uh, the uh, discourse uh, with, among the intellectual people. Yes, so. Would you say that this uh, change in ideas is uh, a movement from below or from a specifically an intellectual group, and a group that is in, the, in fact an elite, an elite group? Very so in what sense would you say this is a emancipation a kind of emancipation movement. Can you understand me? That's a very good question. I would say that primitivism is uh, an elite movement, but it would connect with wider movements like the black movement in Brazil, which was uh, a grassroots movement, uh, bottom-up, um, and connected with other movements. But primitivism in art and in uh, uh, writing is uh, an elite uh, movement. And you have primitivism or this idea of um, the noble savage, like Rousseau would put it, uh, this idea of the, the noble, uh, innocent, uh, primitive man who has much more um, uh, virtues than the civilized man. This idea that the primitive man is, is more virtuous, you can have it in different uh, periods of history, since the Greek times, then with the utopias, then uh, with uh, the British uh, theatre of, uh, of the, like Afrodan and others, of the end of the 17th century, and then you have Rousseau also in the mid 18th century, and finally, you had, uh, by the end of the 19th century, you had this recovery of the primitive art, of so-called primitive art, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Gauguin, with uh, uh, Brancusi, the, the, the sculptor in Paris, who was producing uh, masks, like the uh, African masks. It was the big period of collection of African masks and, uh, and other, other uh, Artifacts from from Polynesia, from uh, so from different parts of the world. So it's the end of the 19th century with all these collections, and then how uh, artists like Picasso also they were extremely influenced by all this so-called primitive art, which was considered innocent, pure, and closer to the to the mm -hmm. to what would be the essential of the human being or the human kind. Uh, so uh, this had. 
then uh, made it its way to the surrealists of the 20s and 30s and the week of modern art in Sao Paulo in 1922 absorbed all this and that explains why cannibalism was turned on its head uh, and, uh, uh, and explains all this movement uh, uh, praising the innocence of the, um, of the native Brazilian Native American uh, in, the, in the territory of Brazil when the Portuguese arrived uh, and explains all this uh, disruption, uh, proposed disruption with the Portuguese colonial period. Is it too long? No, I, I understood. Do, do you want to say more? Um, it, of cheating girls, of the role of cheating girls. Do you know something about and if it is relating or there is something about the role of these people in all this uh, process of emancipation that you, you have noted in the case of Brazil. We're talking about uh, nowadays Brazil. Nowadays, nowadays Brazil. Yeah. No, the, 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 the situation in Brazil is far from being settled. Even uh, if we talk about the service of protection of Indians uh, created in 1910, uh, it's still struggling, and they recently they, they had an enormous budget cut. Uh, recently, with uh, this new Brazilian government, uh, uh, it is it is a, a real disaster concerning the service of protection of Indians because they are responsible for all this protection of uh, Indians in different parts of Brazil, mainly in the Amazon area. So it's not uh, 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 it's not. Uh, the process uh, defined for, for forever. It is very disputed because you have m many in the, in the private interests in the Amazon. Uh, and so you have the exclusion of uh, poor people, the exclusion of uh, peasants, exclusion of Indians. So all this process, you have uh, cri criminal actions against, against these people who were uh, uh, working those lands. So it's far from a, a process sorted out. Yeah, absolutely right. Este, tengo traduzco, sí. pero tengo que traducir cuatro preguntas y corrijo las cuatro respuestas, no las cuatro preguntas. Um, alguien, este, creo que usted preguntó sobre el modelo, la diferencia entre el, el racismo en, en las colonias británicas y las colonias portuguesas. ¿Cuál era la pregunta? Toda la pregunta. Sí, sí, pero es una esa comparación. Ajá. Este, si entendí bien, este, a ver, eh, los británicos al inicio tomaron como modelo el, la colonización griega, este, en la que precisamente no establecían mucho contacto con la población nativa, ¿no? Este, con los autóctonos. No había mucha, no había mucho contacto, no había mucha mistura, ¿no? Misigenación. Eh, por ejemplo, este, los británicos en India simplemente, creo que sí hubo un poco, sí hubo comercio, pero no trataron de interactuar demasiado. El modelo fue distinto, este modelo fue distinto al de los holandeses, al de los portugueses. Este, si no me equivoco, los británicos, este, eh, la meta era conquistar más y más territorios. Este, habían poblaciones arianas y solo fue recién en 1920 cuando se los consideró a esos a esos nativos como ciudadanos entonces el modelo británico era un modelo de clara segregación eh, y también este dieron como a un no un emperador sino como un gobernador o, o bueno el poder era indirecto por ejemplo en el caso de África y este no se, pro, se, se proponía la no se propugnaba la conversión pero no era un modelo basado en la conversión, sino en el dominio político. Eh, por ejemplo, habían eh, impuestos en los territorios eh, y también estaba esta idea eh, de la superioridad de la raza blanca. ¿no? Perdón, este, en el caso portugués, si bien había la, la idea de la superioridad de la raza blanca, eh, todavía había espacio para la negociación en vista de que había mucha dependencia eh, para dependencia de el, la población, eh, dependencia de la corona eh, portuguesa, del imperio portugués, por la población nativa, ¿no? Entonces, había la conversión eh, de los nativos, pero también la, la integración de los nativos, ¿no? 
Este, en Portugal sí es cierto, de nuevo como argumenta el profesor, eh, que existió discriminación como segregación. La segunda pregunta es con la, lo de... Uh, creo que era tu pregunta, ¿no? Era about the feathers. Sí, ¿Cuál era esa pregunta? El concepto de darle mi conocimiento tácito. Tacit knowledge. ¿Qué relación tenía con el trabajo de la experiencia de hacer, tomarse el trabajo para, para saber cómo se hizo, qué, qué, sense, qué importancia tuvo ¿no? el trabajo con plumas. Eh, claro, este, y la profesora este, menciona de que en realidad es bastante interesante la pregunta. Eh, hay un grupo de la Universidad de Harvard trabajando en proyectos similares y ella en la Universidad de Cambridge y es este, realizado por historiadores, ¿no? Eh, antes los historiadores solían pensar de que la información la van a encontrar en los textos, meramente en los libros, ¿no? Pero, eh, no obstante, también hay que mirar al conocimiento tácito, ¿no? El conocimiento que se puede encontrar a, tra a partir de la historia material, ¿no? La historia cultural. Es, es algo que, está, que en los objetos está implicado y que se transmite de generación en generación. Eh, hay, que replantear, hay que plantearse cómo, repe, cómo reaprender, este, cómo este conocimiento es significativo y este, cómo a partir de eso se puede recrear un mundo material. Es algo que también estaba en la pregunta y que también este, dijo ella, pensar algo así como una etnografía. Realmente no importa el, el, lo que, o sea, el objeto Qué, el, qué es el objeto, ¿no? sino las propiedades que pueda tener, los sentidos que puedan estar involucrados, las emociones. Eh, fue bastante interesante la respuesta. Eh, la, la otra pregunta, ¿cuál fue? Eh, y ahí mismo se remarcaba el uso del de, de empleo de otro autor que es Tim Hinton, que habla de la tecnología como una que debe ser no solo un trabajo técnico, Sí, la, ahí era para mí. Creo que dijo de que, bueno, eso. Este, y la otra pregunta la que nos era sobre, la, sobre eh, el, en ocasión del centenario, pero no de independencia. Centenario de 1922. Eh, independencia. Sí. Y eh, había toda una corriente que resaltaba los elementos primitivos, propios, indígenas y era el primitivismo, me comentaba, le preguntaba si esto tenía, cómo se, se reflejaba como un movimiento de abajo si parece que fue hecho por un grupo de eh, cultural. Sí, este, el primitivismo eh, está conectado con movimientos mucho más grandes. Eh, si es que, en el caso del el arte y de la literatura, el primitivismo sí está involucrado eh, para las élites. ¿no? Eh, desde siempre había existido la idea del buen salvaje, esta, idea, esta imagen del hombre eh, salvaje, del nativo, que es más virtuoso que el hombre civilizado. Y esto en realidad tiene raíces en distintas civilizaciones, desde, lo, desde tiempos eh, de la Grecia. ¿no? Eh, a finales del siglo XIX, no sé, eh, en el arte, en el primitivismo, pero en el ramo del arte, Surgen eh, varias obras, ¿no? por ejemplo, mencionó una escultura en París, eh, mencionó la, eh, la moda de las eh, máscaras africanas y de los artefactos polinésicos, y también a Picasso en el arte primitivista, ¿no? eh, tratando de capturar la esencia de este ser humano. ¿no? En las, las obras que mencionó el profesor sirvieron también en... Eh, eh, como influencia para que en Sao Paulo, en el año de 1922, al celebrarse el centenario de la independencia de Brasil, eh, se diera la Semana del Arte Moderno. Y fue ahí donde se propone esta ruptura con la, los pensamientos antiguos ¿no? este, colonizadores. ¿no? Eh, y ahí mencionó al canibalismo como una forma de enfrentar a toda esta ideología pasada. La otra pregunta. La otra era pues nada, la presencia, el rol de los chingueros, entre todos. Lo que estaba viendo. Sí, eso no. 
de esa no tomé muchas este, este, notas, pero dijo de que eh, sí este, había un servicio, chiringueiros eran los caucheros, ¿no? los caucheros sí. en Brasil. Este, o sea, se trató de, eh, de establecer un servicio en protección a los indios, eh, no obstante, en la Amazonía brasileña había un interés privado, ¿no? eh, se excluyeron en principio los indios y esto también se... Este, eh, tuvo como consecuencia las acciones criminales a ellos. No sé si quieres complementar eso, por favor. Oh, creo que usted puede decir. Y, y, y está, no, no solo ellos, también eh, eh, camponeses pobres eh, que, que estaban ahí, que, que bueno, es el caso que, 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 que fue indicado. Entonces, eh, es, más, es un, un ambiente étnico y social más, más grande. Camponeses son campesinos. También campesinos, sí. Uh -huh. Bueno. Ya. Bueno, entonces quisiera que le pongan un aplauso a los.